What's this going to be? He's up by 1.5! 56.1 on the clock. That is for him. That's it. That's it. Whacking it. What a race we just had. I just got done watching Hardline Tasmania. I didn't get to watch it live because it started at midnight. So I woke up early, I've watched it, and I wanted to get this video out for you guys so that you know what happened in case you haven't had a chance to watch it yet. Uh, the track overall has been universally loved by all the riders. Uh, this is kind of a racer's track, as people have been calling it. It's got everything. Yes, it has big jumps, but all the rock gardens and the technical sessions have really called out to especially a lot of the UCI racers. So it's exciting to see such a new track and a new event get so much praise from everybody. Before we get into the qualifying and the results, uh, I just wanted to go over kind of some fun things that happened throughout the week. Uh, Gracie Hanna was the first woman to ever uh, complete a top to bottom on a hard line track. She also was able to complete a race run. So she took first out of two. Um, unfortunately, the other lady that made it to get top to bottom in a race run, she did have a couple of crashes. She's okay though. Um, but yes, Gracie Hanna is the very first woman to ever complete complete a Red Bull Hardline top to bottom as well as a Red Bull Hardline race run. So good for her. Um, we have, as always, we had some fan favorite free riders there. I did a poll on YouTube to see how we felt about free riders at Hardline and it was pretty much unanimous. 85% of you said that you'd much rather have them there just to watch and see them compete because it's fun to see them just attempting the race run rather than maybe giving up those positions to people who might be a little more competitive and I respect that. I think that's really fun. Uh, we did see some couple no-handers from Reed Boggs. Matt Jones was just very focused on getting to the bottom uh, and a couple other of the guys did some one-footers and fun stuff. So really fun to see those guys there and to see the, you know, I think Hardline's kind of an event that pulls everybody in, which is actually really, really fun. Uh, this was kind of a funny story said on the broadcast. Um, Dennis Luffman showed up with his Canyon Sender and apparently it was in pretty rough condition. And Dan Atherton legit would not let him race with it. He literally made him ride his bike so that he wouldn't have to ride his Canyon Sender. So practiced and raced all week, pretty much on Dan Atherton's bike, which is pretty cool. Uh, not everyone can say that. Okay, on to the race. Qualifying yesterday, it was completely different conditions than what they were used to um, practice. The top was extremely wet and slick. The middle section just seemed to ignore that it was raining and it was an absolute dust bomb. And then the bottom half was too windy. They actually ended up moving the finish line to just after the road gap. So if you look at the race times and you look at the qualifying times, there is gonna be a discrepancy because the finish line was moved. So do not compare, you can't compare those two um, times side to side because there is a difference. So um, keep that in mind. This morning as they were practicing, um, a lot of the ladies that were trying to do it just could not get themselves to hit the very last jump just due to conditions. Um, it was windy and it was very slick as the day before the race, as the day went on, it did dry up. So it was a little bit better. A lot practice this morning was not great for a lot of people who were hoping to kind of squeeze out a couple more runs and knock off a couple more features right before the actual race. As far as the qualifying runs go, um, Bernard Kerr, of course, qualified first. Um, the co consensus was that he was hitting gaps nobody else's was. Nobody else was. Uh, there's kind of that really um, downsloped drop near the top. He was gapping onto that, like pre-hopping and then hopping off. Um, he had a gap lower down called the Wombat Gap, which all of the top five riders, not well, most of the top five riders, ended up using for their race runs. So the Wombat Gap definitely was a um, the Wombat Gap definitely was a key factor in a top flying run. Before the races, the consensus was that middle section was going to be the most important. I think it's Brennigan's Highway, I think is what it was called. Um, but anyway, the highway section was the most important and the corner leading into it was going to be the key corner. Bernard Kerr said that that was the corner that would kind of win or break the race for you. And it was very interesting because that, while that still held true, it was the top section in the finals that really made the difference. Connor Fearon very early, someone who, for whatever reason, I did not even think was going to be, be competing. I thought he was just a wild card and I was 
To be honest with you, with my um, preview video, I was really confused what the wild card riders were. Turns out they were all invited. Um, we'll see if they get to go to Wales. I think Connor Fearon definitely should after this performance. He finished in the top five. But the first half of all the riders, Connor really was kind of the story. He finished the top half probably five seconds faster than everyone else, looked incredibly quick through the rest of the race, and no one could really catch up to him. After split number one, he was probably three to two seconds faster than everybody up until Ronan Dunn caught him. Ronan Dunn passed him by a second and a half. On the broadcast, Rob Warner said that Dunn's bike didn't even show up for the first couple of days of practice. In his first run, Dunn sent it all the way, uh, rode every feature first run, and then his third run, he did a full top to bottom. So Dunn was definitely feeling it on this track. The kind of the story of the race for Ronin and why he did so well was he didn't really square off any corners. He came into corners very wide and exited with great speed, um, which was surprising too because in the halfway down the track they had a speed trap he went 55 kilometers an hour which is still insanely fast but a lot of the other racers were getting into the 60s even 67 kilometers an hour i think was the fastest we saw through the speed trap so he really wasn't had that top speed but i think it was just his consistency he maintained his speed throughout the entire track which is why he did so well he rode incredibly fluid he had in great rhythm this was a real rhythm track a lot of racers were saying if you got out of your rhythm or you were trying to force things it wasn't going to work out for you um, and then again that top steep section was the entire story of the race um, overall I think it's a fan was a fantastic race um, down to the track down to the racers and the camaraderie to everybody getting down and also the broadcast as always Red Bull kills it um, I will just read off the top five real quick we had Ronan Dunn in first Bernard Kerr in second George Brannigan in third, Mateo Inges in fourth, and then Connor Fearon in fifth. Um, I'll put a bracket up so that you can see what it looks like. So let me know in the comments what you thought of the race. Um, what did you like? What did you not like? Were you surprised by the results? Um, thank you all for the support on these last couple of videos on Hardline. It's been really fun to cover these races. Subscribe if you want more coverage on all the races. I will be covering all the USI races and all the Crankworks races, Hardline Wales, and then Rampage here at the end of the year. So if you're interested in that, give me a subscribe. Like the video if you want more content like this. And I will see all of you guys in the next one. Peace.